Good morning. So, as Sharon Scriven said to me a few minutes ago, you can't possibly say anything in ten minutes, so I'll probably take a little bit longer. But because of that, I'm going to concentrate on the bladder rather than the pelvis. And um, don't ask me questions at the end. Um, you can send me a, a message via the, the museum um, Twitter feed. So, yes, it is working. So, first question. Why on earth, as a historian, am I, am I here talking about bladder pain? Surely this is a disease of the modern world? Isn't it something that people call functional? Or um, a psychosomatic, perhaps? Now, you can't surely imagine that the stoical Victorians suffered from this sort of thing, or people in the medieval times... Actually, if we say functional now, in Victorian times, they would probably have used the word hysteria, not meaning quite what it means now, from the Greek hysteros, the womb, the disease of the wandering womb, something to do with things moving around. Go a little bit further back in time, if you've got unexplained terrible pain, well, perhaps that was a punishment from God. Go a little bit further back in time, witchcraft, magic, it's difficult, isn't it? Because the trouble is, when we, when we look at the limits of our knowledge, we don't really know what to do. We do tend to make things up a little bit. So is it a disease of modern world? Well, let's go back, uh, ooh, I don't know, 1,100 years? If you look at the works of the Saxons, then Bladerwerk is bladder pain in Saxon, and there were um, medical treatments for bladder pain. Now, it wasn't completely random. The Saxons knew causes of bladder pain. They realised there were bladder stones causing pain. There is separate treatment for bladder stones. This is bladder pain in general. There were, there were certain treatments for that. You use boiled wood march, which I believe is a herb, and obviously, as one does, eat a roasted starling. But there's unexplained pain. How did they explain uh, this, this terrible pain? It's like someone stabbed you. But there's no wound, there's no blood, there's no spear. Well, clearly, you've been shot by an arrow, a magic arrow. Who shoots magic arrows? Elves. Elf shot was the explanation for unexplained abdominal pain. And the cure? Magic. And there is actually a spell against elf shot in the works of the, the leeches who were the, the Saxon uh, physicians. Bring you a little bit up to date, shall we? A couple of hundred years ago. So, um, 1808, this guy, Wilma or William um, Elmer, was a medical student. And in his notes, uh, he makes notes of a patient who had symptoms that were identical to the stone. Clearly bladder stone, but there was no stone. In 1836, Parrish, Joseph Parrish, this is in America, um, he described three patients, two women and a man, pain, terrible pain, Clearly bladder stone, no stone. Both these, both these guys uh, were under, under this chap, um, Philip Singh Physic, who's been called the father of American medicine. And he described this condition. He didn't write it down, but his two students wrote it down for us. Um, and he called it tic douloureux of the bladder. Now, tic douloureux is trigeminal neuralgia. So clearly what they're describing is a neuropathic pain of the bladder 200 years ago. And it's not just him. Um, George Gross, another famous American um, doctor, called it neuralgia of the bladder, terrible pain, no obvious cause. Um, the French, uh, le feu, same, but in French. And cystalgia, quite a nice word. Uh, so clearly we're looking at a, a nervous disorder. But not always, because they also realized that there was something going on in some of these patients in their bladders, but it was confusing still. So again, physics students wrote about ulceration in the bladder, but there was nothing causing it. There was no stone rubbing in the bladder while they were getting the pain. Louis, uh, Louis Mercier, the, the Frenchman, he described ulcers that had perforated through the whole layers of the bladder in, with terrible pain. And then Harry Fenwick at the London Hospital towards uh, the end of the century talked about solitary ulcers. Now, Harry Fenwick had an advantage. The cystoscope. So if you do have a chance to go and look at the museum exhibition, you will see this thing at the top, which is the cruise endoscope, which is 150 years old. You would struggle 
to see an ulcer through that, but it, it wouldn't be possible. But what Hurry Fennick had was the new German cystoscope that came in after the invention of the, um, the light bulb. And he could see these ulcers. And um, if you look at the... Did I press that properly? If you look at the picture there, you'll re perhaps recognise that. So he described these ulcers as the size of a shilling. Uh, and I've provided you with a shilling. The size of a shilling and it looks like the scar of a bullet on a target, which I think is a fantastic uh, expression. Described it in young, often young men actually, with terrible genital pain, um, and saw these, saw these ulcers. But that's not what we call it. No one calls it Fenix solitary ulcer anymore. We call them Hunner's ulcers. So who was Hunner? This is Hunner. Guy Leroy Hunner. So this is a name that we still talk about now, a Hunner's ulcer. If you look at that picture, and compare it with Fenwick's picture, which I took from that book in 1904, which is also in the exhibit, it's the same, but in black and white. So looking again, great expression, like a bullet hit a target, a starburst picture. So he described this in 1914, he then uh, republished that paper, and then later in 1918 he, he, he took the series further on in a group of eight, eight women who had intractable pain and had these ulcers. And the descriptions are just what we hear in clinic today. But again, we talk about Hunter's ulcers, but that's not what we call the disease. We call it all sorts of things. But if you talk to most doctors, GPs, if you say interstitial cystitis, they'll have an idea what you're talking about. So where did that come from? Well, up until recently, as I was basically up until I started reading more about for this talk, I thought it was that chap, Alexandra Skeen, a chap with a beard. I thought that was the first description of the word, or use of the word interstitial cystitis in his book um, in 1878. He was a Scotsman who was working in America, interested in diseases of women. But actually it wasn't. It was in the book by Samuel David Gross, and that's the chap there in the middle with the um, interesting hair and fantastic whisper, uh, whiskers. So he wrote this book. Now, this only appears in the third edition, and the third edition uh, was edited by his son, um, Samuel Weisselgross, and I, I'm told that that's the son in the background there. So this was the first use of the word interstitial cystitis. There's some thought that it may have come before that from, from, uh, from Germany. And they're talking um, at this time about ulceration perforating the bladder. And so this is just some of the names that we've given it over, the t over time. I'm not going to go through all of those because I haven't got time to do it, but I'll just pick out a couple of things. So if you're looking, again, well, we started up at the top there. Where's my pointer? Um, tic douloureux, neuralgia. This is some sort of neurological problem. And at the same time, ulcer, 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 two things. And if I can just point out here, Magnus Fall pointing out in 1987, he's sort of saying, do, do we think, guys, there might be two things going on here? Something, you know, ulcer and non-ulcer? How do we diagnose it? How did they diagnose it? So today, often we talk about a diagnosis of exclusion. That often comes up when we're discussing this with patients and with the juniors. Uh, did they do that? Yeah, they did, actually. So the work, if you look at the works of, of, um, of physics, then he's saying, whatever you do, don't miss the stone. Pass the sound, feel for the stone. And he was famous for getting patients in all sorts of positions so that he'd try to feel for bladder stones so he didn't miss the diagnosis. Hurry Fennick says the same. Make sure it's not a stone. Make sure it's not venereal disease. And he makes a point when he describes his solitary ulcer in his lecture to the London Hospital that these gentlemen were, did not have venereal disease. They'd not had intercourse. Is it TB? There was lots of TB. They would look at the microscopy. Is it TB? Is it malignant? Is it a malignant ulcer? So they did the same. Um, this sort of was crystallised in 1988 with the, um, the description of um, how we would diagnose interstitial cystitis. Very much, although they were inclusions, very much a, a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, but there are inclusions, aren't they? And um, there are things that we talk about or have talked about over time. Even in the early to mid 19th, um, 20th century, people were worried because they were missing patients. They, people are looking for Hunter's ulcers or Fenix ulcers. They're not there and they're saying, well, you can't possibly have this, madam. It must be something else. People are saying that now. Just because there's nothing in the bladder doesn't mean to say there's not a problem. 
Commemorations, that's an interesting topic that people have discussed. First described by hand in 1949 called Blood Spots of the Bladder. The word probably appeared in Campbell's Urology in, uh, in 1978, supported by Messing and Stamey in the same year as a useful diagnostic tool in interstitial cystitis. But interestingly, even in that paper, they talk about it be, glomerations being in, in bladders of other patients, including patients with stress incontinence. So even back then, it was a slightly dodgy. Now, what about the management? Mercury was used uh, in the 19th century, it's mentioned by um, uh, Physic and, and, and Fennec, and of course mercury was used for the treatment of syphilis. So again, th there is that link there, could this be venereal? Um, Joseph Paris, when he described those three cases, certainly one woman said the only thing that actually worked was very high doses of opium. Silver nitrate was used throughout the 19th century. Phenol, I remember having, uh, injecting phenol when I was in Nottingham as a registrar. That started in the 30s. Uh, DMSO, uh, DMSO, now that was discovered in 1867. 100 years later, people started to use that for, for bladder pain. Um, the sodium uh, pentasulfate, it's almiron, discovered uh, or described in Germany in the 1950s, started to be used in bladder pain in the 1980s, Parsons, and hyaluronic acid, sister stat, um, in, it started to be used in Canada in 1995, a paper by Morales, I think followed by a paper by including uh, Professor Nickel as well the next year. Um, so what about surgery? Now I find this interesting. So I was surprised that the first surgical treatment I could find for bladder pain was actually diversion of the urinary tract. So this chap, Lawson Tate, was a Scotsman, but he, he moved to Birmingham. He's quite famous in the history of gynaecology. And he wrote a paper in The Lancet in 1870, and he described diverting the urinary tract, diverting the bladder in women by creating a vesicle vaginal fistula and the pain went away. But what's more interesting than that is he's actually not describing what he did. He's describing what his boss did when he was a student in Edinburgh, uh, which was James Young Simpson, as in chloroform. So this was actually prior to that. It was probably the, in the 1850s this was being done. And I was quite surprised about that. So surgery now, um, resection of Hunter's ulcers we sometimes talk about. Well, that's what Fenwick said. Fenwick said for his solitary ulcers, he would suggest scraping them away, curatage of the ulcer, um, either blind or under cystoscopic control. Hunter, interestingly, also uses surgery, but he actually uses open surgery, a cystotomy and resection of the ulcer. That was back in, in 1914. Later on, he starts to turn away from that uh, uh, as being too aggressive. Fulguration, so cystic diathermy of, of the ulcers, that, that came in when the technology came in. So that was 1910 with uh, Edwin Beer. But so in the 1920s, really, that we started to be used for these sorts of um, painful ulcers. And of course, cystic distension has been talked about a long time, and that probably um, was first written down, if not first carried out by Herman Bumpus in 1930. So I hope I haven't gone for, on for too long. So chronic pelvic pain, is it a disease of the modern world? No, it's clearly not. That was a silly thing to say, wasn't it? 1808, so 200 years plus. So what was happening in 1808? Well, the Peninsula War was still going on. Mad King George was on the throne and Jefferson was the American president. How have we got on since then? So uh, we've now got a name. Actually, no, we haven't got a name, have we? We've not done very well there. Um, what about what the cause is? Well, I think we'll find that the discussions now are very similar to the discussions then. We're talking about neuropathic pain, but then some people have got ulcers, so there's clearly something physical happening. We don't really know. And as for management, I'm very much hoping these gentlemen are going to tell me what to do in the next uh, hour or so. Thank you very much. <laughs>